A boy named Ming suddenly finds himself in what he initially thinks is Detroit. But on closer inspection, he is actually in a post-apocalyptic world where monsters and eldritch horrors alike are abundant. He rubs his eyes and pinches himself to see if this is all some sick dream. But it is all real. Morbid corpses claw and tug at his pant legs, calling him a witch who will deliver them from all this evil and suffering. Ming is confused as to why they are calling him a witch, but when he sees his reflection on a broken window, he discovers that his appearance is indeed that of a witch. Something is clearly wrong. The corpses are relentless, and they reach out to Ming to drag him or her. I don't know what pronouns Ming goes by now. Eventually, Ming is dragged down into the abyss. <gasps> Ming wakes up with a jolt in his single, loft-type apartment, still in a cold sweat. This isn't the first time he's had this dream before. To his credit, dreaming that you're a female witch in a post-apocalyptic wasteland isn't exactly a normal dream. Ming notices the date, February 22nd. He has a doctor's appointment today. It is revealed that his name isn't Ming either. This is simply the persona he adopted when he envisioned himself as the witch. His real name is Lu, and he's just a normal 18-year-old living all alone. Two years ago, a car accident nearly caused him to go blind. But thanks to the wonders of science, technology, and a dash of pixie dust, the operation was a success. However, as a result of this surgery, he began seeing weird things. After scurrying for weeks, he finally found a doctor willing to humor him and his weird visions. He visits the office of Yan, an ophthalmologist. Lu explains to Yang his condition, to which the doctor replies that Lu just recently underwent eye surgery. Although it was a risky operation, it was generally considered a success, with mild to minimal side effects afterwards. Since there might be more to this than what the reports say, Yang asks Lu to elaborate. Lu is nervous about revealing more information, but Yang reassures Lu that he is an adult and he can take it. Lu swallows hard before recounting that one evening. While heading to the convenience store, he saw a girl walking a gigantic corgi. After rubbing his eyes, the corgi eventually flew into the sky. Ten years of medical school hadn't prepared Yan for this. Maybe he should have dabbled in psychiatry instead. Doctors and orderlies run around the fairgrounds in search of Lu. It looks like not even this hospital is willing to help him. Lu boards a bus bound for his apartment, where he takes solace in one of his few joys, gotcha games. After fawning over by a virtual dot ping file in his game, he glances outside and notices a wide array of monsters surrounding the city. An exasperated Liu sighs, rubs his eyes, and looks again. All of a sudden, the monsters are gone. Even Liu doesn't know when his eyes start seeing strange things. A small snake thing tells his host, a young woman, that Liu is destined to turn into a witch. Following this advice, the young woman approaches Liu, but Liu thinks she is a suspicious person and leaves. Now he has to deal with them on the streets too. The young woman is puzzled, but the snake thing insists that its data scan of Liu is correct. Somehow, that young man will become a witch who will destroy the world. The woman takes it upon herself as a hero of justice to bring Lu to, well, justice. Meanwhile, Lu strolls home, having grown tired of finding a hospital that will take him seriously. However, he doesn't give up. He bumps into a man wearing a bunny outfit who appears to be handing out flyers for a bunch of toys. Lu finds this a little odd, and he excuses himself. As soon as Lu goes out of sight, the bunny transforms into something far more hideous and grotesque. He looks exactly like Donnie Darko. Maybe it is. When Lu arrives home, he discovers a strange statue that I'm not sure exactly belongs to any major world religion, but I could be wrong. He receives a call from his brother, Shu, who tells him that he got him a Dainichi King statue, an item said to ward off evil spirits. Shu heard that his brother started seeing strange things, so just in case Lu accidentally entered the tomb of King Tut, the small statue should be able to ward off a couple of evil spirits. Shui says he is about to go socialize, which Lu takes to mean hitting the nightclub. Shui laughs and corrects him. He isn't some club host, but a male public relations agent. Call it what you will, he works in a nightclub. A malevolent creature creeps steadily up on Shu, but he simply raises his hand, which removes a large chunk of the monster's body. Shu doesn't take too kindly to having his important brother time being interrupted. He reassures the evil spirit that this won't take long. After removing his cigarette, he performs a short incantation that deletes the ghost from existence. Ghostbusters with their oversized vacuum cleaners are looking really silly right now. Meanwhile, Lu wonders if anyone would be willing to buy his strange statue secondhand. He then falls comfortably into bed, and though he is a bit concerned about the rabbit man he ran into earlier, he falls fast asleep. However, the next moment, Lu wakes up again. He sits up and finds himself in an unfamiliar bedroom. 
But whatever room this is, they didn't clean up. Look closely at the right side and tell me that's not what I think it is. He then hears someone approaching the apartment. He isn't alone. A woman in her early 20s, evidently from a night out of drinking, saunters into her apartment. Exhausted from both work and drinks, she promptly falls into bed and falls asleep. Now that Lou knows he is in a woman's room, it's time for him to make like a tree and leave. As he approaches the exit, he feels a strange and eerie presence approaching. This nightmare on Elm Street isn't over yet. The door opens, and though the chain lock's efforts are valiant, it snaps. Lou looks up and realizes that it is the same rabbit from the night before, and I don't think he's here to hand out flyers. Lou braces himself for whatever diabolical or evil thing is about to happen, but the rabbit walks right through him, literally. Confused, Lou turns around and sees that the rabbit is about to stab the defenseless woman to death. Lou begins to panic. His voice goes dry, and though he wants to shout at the woman to warn her, sound doesn't seem to come out. He finally musters the courage to at least try, but the woman is unresponsive to his cries. Lou does nothing but watch as the rabbit murders the woman in cold blood. The rabbit doesn't stop at one stab, nor two, not even three. It's as if he were the entire Roman Senate, and the woman was Julius Caesar. Only this time, there isn't going to be a Shakespeare play about this. A horrified Lou nearly throws up, but it gets scarier. The rabbit turns around and sees Lou. As the masked murderer approaches, Lou slips to the floor, and his fate is uncertain. <laughs> A few hours later, police converge outside the apartment block in response to the woman's murder. A white-haired woman, Jang, arrives on the scene. One of her attendants, Hua, informs her that a bakery operator is awaiting her presence. As she enters the crime scene, she meets with the operator, Shui, who happens to be downing some cup noodles. She disregards his small talk and wants only the nitty-gritty details. Shu sighs and gives her a small tuft of hair he discovered at the crime scene. Without gloves, might I add. The presence of rabbit fur unnerves Jang, who recognizes this to be from the body of the Twilight Witch's familiar, Mr. Rabbit. The witch is returning. Shu knows that investigating and eliminating the sources of these urban legends is their job, but if these killings continue, it will be hard for them to keep this incident under wraps. Half a year ago, Jang personally killed the Twilight Witch. This leads them to wonder if Mr. Rabbit is going around collecting blood samples in order to resurrect its master. However, Shu hypothesizes that this isn't exactly the case. He provides two pieces of evidence. First, Mr. Rabbit materialized and acted on his own without waiting for the Twilight Witch's orders. Even if he had some fail-safe programming that allowed him to act on his own, the second piece of evidence is that Mr. Rabbit's spiritual power has grown from C level to B level. So even if it were collecting blood, it isn't using it to empower the Twilight Witch, it's empowering itself. This leads him to conclude that Rabbit isn't trying to revive the Twilight Witch at all. It's trying to break free from her influence. If Rabbit succeeds, it might become a witch. Jang closes her eyes. She won't allow such a thing to happen. She turns around to leave, and she asks Hua to help her investigate. Meanwhile, Lee wakes up again in a cold sweat. He is unsure if what he witnessed was a dream. But if it weren't, he wouldn't be alive right now. He notices the time and date. February 23rd, 10.3 p.m. Lee slept the whole day. He gets up and prepares to order some food, but he discovers a folded piece of paper hidden underneath his pillow. He unfurls it and discovers it is a flyer of rabbit toys, the same flyer the rabbit tried to give him. Lee feels a cold chill go up his spine. He never took one of these flyers home. He hears his doorbell ring, and at this late hour, he can be sure it isn't some religious nut. It's something far worse. A voice asks if anyone is inside, to which Lou replies there isn't. Idiot. Realizing that Lee is inside, the voice announces that he is letting himself in. Lee begins to panic but thankfully he previously had a home surveillance system installed. He checks his cameras, and his heart nearly leaps out of his chest as he stares directly into the eyes of Mr. Rabbit, whose face mask is still bloody from murdering the woman. Mr. Rabbit was rejected from five nights at Freddy's, so he decided to take matters into his own hands. Lee falls to the floor out of fear. Meanwhile, Shui is out at a nightclub doing important work by attending to his clients. Hunting down demon murderers just doesn't pay the bills enough. However, he suddenly sits up, sensing that the alarm he set on the statue he gave Lee has been triggered. His little brother is in danger. He throws on his coat and apologizes to the two ladies. He might be a ladies man, but he's a big brother first and foremost. Don't worry Lee, brother's coming. Meanwhile, Hua is out on the streets, helping with the investigation as instructed. Previously, they were monitoring strange fluctuations in magical energy. Jang predicted that the next target would be a young boy named Lee. 
As expected, Rabbit's spirit signature pops up on Hua's tracker. She immediately contacts Jang to inform her of Rabbit's appearance at Li's house. Jang commends Hua on a job well done, and she tells her to authorize her to act. However, on the other end of the phone, Hua screams out in terror before the line goes silent. Jang frantically uses her perception eyes to discover what has happened to Hua. What she sees horrifies her, a malevolent presence whose spiritual energy far eclipses the S rank level. <coughs> Jang experiences horrid flashbacks of the last time such a presence appeared. To say it was a disaster is an understatement. It was a scourge upon the earth. Jang steals herself for what is about to come. The battle isn't over yet. The rabbit breaks down Lee's door, and his heart rate skyrockets. He looks to the side and spies the statue that his brother gave him, and he clutches it tight. Will he use it as a spiritual ward or an outlet for some last prayer? No, Lee uses it to smack the rabbit right on the head. The rabbit is sent tumbling down the staircase, which is enough to seemingly knock the murderer unconscious. Lee is initially fearful that he killed a person, but upon closer inspection, the intruder isn't a human at all, pale skin, red eyes, and bulging veins. No, that's not a college senior. That's a zombie through and through. Disgusted, Lee throws up, but when he looks back, he sees strange spirits such as disembodied eyes, mouths, and organs. Lee realizes that his vision is acting up again, and he collapses. Outside, the world has seemingly turned upside down again. The city is in disarray. Jang walks alone through the boulevard, and she notices that the S-rank spiritual signatures have seemingly disappeared. While surveying the streets, Jang finally discovers Hua. She is heavily injured but nonetheless alive. Hua cries into Jang's arms and apologizes for her failure. She explains that she and her unit were suddenly attacked by waves of C-level and D-level psychic monsters. Had a mysterious girl not arrived to rescue them, they very well might have all been wiped out. She describes her as a girl with long, chestnut brown hair a haughty laugh, and who wields a baseball bat. This just adds more questions to the pile. Jang wonders who this girl is and how she fits into all that has transpired. Is there a new psychic at work? Meanwhile, Shui arrives at Lee's home to find him collapsed on the floor. He spots blood on the statue and laughs. It wasn't meant to be used that way. Regardless, he is relieved that his little brother is all right, which is great because if he died on his watch, then his parents would have killed him once he enters heaven. Shu glances over at the rabbit whom he recognizes as not the same Mr. Rabbit that murdered the woman in cold blood. No, this is some regular C-level zombie. This causes him to suspect that the real Rabbit knows he is being investigated. In the ruins of a city with a Hollywood Mexico City yellow filter, Lee wakes up. That's the last time he tries Jummel's brownies. Suddenly, a great ball of flame bursts in front of him, and from its embers emerges a beautiful woman, clad in fire and drought. Lee wakes up again in a hospital room. At this point, he's passed out and woken up so many times that I'm having trouble figuring out which is a dream and which isn't. Lee tires of seeing these dreams. He regains his bearings and remembers the events that occurred last night, which causes him to feel sick again. In the corner of the room, Hua tells him that what he killed is no longer human. He shouldn't feel bad about killing a zombie. Jang, carrying her signature cane, strolls in to ask Lee some questions. Lee wonders who these two girls are, and realizing that they might know something about his strange visions, he quickly dashes to Jang and holds her hand. He moves so fast that not even Hua could react. Hua kicks his face into a wall for his audacity in holding the hand of her lady. Don't think he'll be let off with just a few broken bones. After beating up Lee a few more times, Jang interviews him regarding the events of last night and his previous visions. Hua grows concerned and unnerved that Lee had a dream about the woman being murdered in her apartment last night, and she wonders if he is lying somehow. However, Jang believes Lee. She explains that sufficient exposure to spiritual phenomena may awaken latent psychic abilities in otherwise normal individuals. That is exactly what happened to Lee. Jang introduces herself as the director of Night Division, an elite group dedicated to investigating and eliminating the paranormal. She tells Lee that he is now too deeply involved in this case, and she will be placing him under house arrest for the time being. She explains that the visions that Lee is seeing are the physical manifestations of myths, urban legends, and ghost stories. The more people believe in a specific legend, the greater the chance that they manifest in reality, a collective subconscious, if you will. These creatures tend to prey on human fear, and they ensure that these monsters don't get a meal. Lee is a bit frightened by all this, but at least he has finally met an organization that understands his situation. 
Jang says she has erected a barrier around the hospital. No legends or ghost stories can come in. As she turns to leave, the doctor, Ching, hands her the autopsy report of the zombie that attacked Lee. On his back is a tattoo of the Solar Eclipse Society, which means that this specific zombie was being controlled. The Solar Eclipse Society is a large criminal organization that harnesses the power of ghost stories and urban legends to their advantage. Just like the creatures they use, little is known about their true nature. Later, Xu vehemently opposes having Lee drafted into the Night Division, despite Ching's confidence that his prophetic visions may give them a tactical advantage. Xu argues that Lee isn't even 20 yet, but upon glancing at Jang, who isn't older than 21, he concedes that point. Regardless, he doesn't agree with them. Jang challenges Xu. If he cares about Lee so much, then he should have no problem personally resolving the Mr. Rabbit problem himself. However, Xu refuses to humor her. Meanwhile, in an old warehouse, a member of the Solar Eclipse Society speaks to Mr. Rabbit, who warns him that the Night Division is now on their tail. Mr. Rabbit is frustrated. He had previously given the Solar Eclipse Society over 20 primordial spirits for the resurrection of the Night Witch, but they were unable to accomplish even this. Rabbit is furious, and he blames it all on Lee. He should have just let himself be a sacrifice for the Witch. 